Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Foster. Violin music by Becca Greenouch. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. What's the best explanation for Joseph Smith's polygamy? Dr. Larry Foster is a non-Mormon polygamy expert at Georgia Tech, and he's going to tackle that conversation and answer that question the best way he can. Uh, so it wasn't like God suddenly said, you should start polygamy. And Joseph Smith asks God, according to the uh, revelation that was written, uh, re recorded in 1830, uh, uh, 1843, uh, that uh, now section 132 of the uh, Utah Mormon uh, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, that uh, he asks, why did you allow Hebrew patriarchs like Abraham and, and, uh, and, and Solomon and, uh, and, uh, and David and all these other people to have pl plural wives. And, and then God tells him it's time to reintroduce the system in a different form in preparation for the millennium. Um, um, that's reading a few extra things into it. But, um, and, so, and then similarly, uh, the argument that he was just uh, mentally disturbed, there's, there's some definite possibilities there, but, um, but you have to ask, you know, is there an assumption that anybody who would think that they wanted to introduce polygamy would automatically have to be mentally disturbed? And, and you know, then you'd have to say, well, all those people in the Bible were mentally disturbed <laughs> and so forth, you know, and, and I, I don't think that that would hold up, but I do think that there are some definite psychological peculiarities about Joseph Smith that I've argued, I've argued several different interpretations that might work to try to help explain how uh, his unusual psychology, his narcissistic and possibly bipolar or manic depressive uh, tendencies uh, might have contributed to uh, imp uh, sort of encouraging him to move toward, toward, uh, toward uh, uh, polygamy. Uh, and, and maybe sincerely believe it was God's will, but mainly might have been his own desires that were being, uh, he was sort of feeding back as coming from God, that sort of thing. Um, I love how you've tried to synthesize the four main arguments, because I will tell you what, I've had, you know, I've talked to several people uh, on the topic of yeah. polygamy. Um, you know, Bill Smith from BYU, Brian Hales, uh, and wild, all coming from very different perspectives. Um, and I've even had a lot of people, uh, either LDS or former RLDS, that, is, that have come at me and said, Joseph was a monogamist. <laughs> yeah, it's, totally, it's totally impossible to argue that. It's, it's, there's no, it, the evidence is overwhelming. Actually, after I finished my dissertation, I uh, gave a talk to the uh, John Whitmer Historical Association, which was the uh, RLDS history group, on what I'd found out about Joseph Smith and polygamy. And I was really worried that somebody would just start laying into me and saying, there, there is no evidence here, and so forth and so on. So I presented the evidence, and I was, uh, nobody challenged me. Nobody challenged the accuracy of my work. And after, I love After the fact the, that you're non-Mormon because it seems like you are now you you come at this with probably the the least biased position that you can be. Well, I try you don't to. Have a dog I try, in the fight. I, I, well, I do. I mean, I have. I mean, I don't like polygamy particularly, but I I, I, I see it as a, a potentially valid uh, way of organizing things. It's not my way of organizing things, uh, and I can't see it would be mind-bogglingly difficult to try to handle more than one wife. I think one wife is more than enough to, uh, to try to deal with uh, effectively and, and have a decent relationship with. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I'm open to a variety of, of possibilities. I just want to see if they can be made to work and what, uh, what makes them work. One of the interesting things, uh, I, I was just, I was, so I gave this talk at the, um, at the um, uh, RLDS conference and afterward, uh, people were very favorable to it, surprisingly. I'd been getting, hearing more uh, RLDS people telling me over and over that Joseph Smith hadn't done it. They'd been offering me books and other things they'd written that proved that he hadn't. Of course, I had the evidence that he had. Um, and uh, afterwards, one woman came up to me and thanked me from the bottom of her heart 
for showing that Joseph Smith could have been wrong. <laughs> I, did, I, I did not said anything like that. But it was absolutely perfect because that was the original RLDS position. The original RLDS knew that Joseph Smith had introduced polygamy and they had rejected it as, as a, a deviation from what it should have been. But over time, that was not an easy argument to sustain. And when the RLDS leader, who was ironically Joseph Smith's son, Joseph III, for 50 years, really did a brilliant job of organizing a counter to the Utah Mormons under Brigham Young. And he was adamant, following Emma, Joseph Smith's wife, who hated polygamy and taught her all of her children to hate polygamy. Uh, he was adamant that his father had never been involved with that. And so it's, it's ironic that the, the father introduces something and the son <laughs> creates a, a counter group that, that uh, opposes it. Um, but both of them were very smart people, and uh, so there's a lot of complexity there that's, that's fun to deal with. But one of the things I really like, uh, I, I finally put this all together in a dissertation and then, and then in my first book, uh, Religion and Sexuality, um, which was published by Oxford University Press, uh, which was a study of all three groups, the you know, Shakers, the Oneida community, and the Mormons, trying to figure out how each of the groups first conceived of an alternative system then introduced it and then made it work, institutionalized it for at least 30 years successfully in each case. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Shakers have lasted for over 200 years. They're dying out now, but, uh, but um, they, they had kept the celibate system throughout that period. Uh, the Oneida community had over 30 years of running this incredible combination of uh, complex marriage and all the things that went with it. And the Mormons had, in practice, in Utah from about 1850 to 1890, uh, the manifesto, and then uh, an after period. But there was a hardcore period of about 40 years or so, uh, 1850 to 1890. Is that, yeah, mathematically that works. I'm, I'm not much good on math. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, that's about a 40 year period when, when that was held up for Mormons as the highest form of marriage. A lot of people were monogamously married, but, but, there were, but it, if you wanted to really get ahead in the hierarchy, you needed to have more than one wife and so forth. So, um, so um, they lasted for a long period. Anyhow, the, other, the thing I liked about the reaction to my first book um, was I had people from all four of these different frameworks you know, the argument that he was just oversexed, the argument that uh, he didn't do it at all, it was just the corruption by other unnamed or... Most Usually they like to blame it on Brigham Young. Brigham Young is, 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 the, say, is the obvious uh, person to pin it on, uh, or that it was just God's will, and Joseph was just sort of mechanically following God's will, or that it was just mentally disordered and disturbed. Um, I've had people from all four of these people say they really liked my treatment of this and that it supported their point of view. <laughs> so, so I feel like I've accomplished something because I've described it in an open enough way that um, people who have very different views see in what I've written exactly something supporting what they already thought. But in fact, I'm not supporting any of those points of view. I'm raising the points of view and presenting some evidence that you could use to try to figure out for yourself what you thought. Yeah, well, and here's what was interesting. So yesterday, uh, we went to lunch, mm -hmm. um, and the person sitting next to me, Marianne, she had uh, attended BYU, and she told me, and if you want to pick up your book, you're oh, welcome yeah. to sell this thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased about this, actually. This has been in print for uh, 38 years now, yes. uh, since 1981. Uh, this, is the, this is a 10th paperback. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't match Fawn Brody. I mean, uh, Fawn Brody's book, uh, No Man Knows My History on Joseph Smith, was continuously in print in hardback for full 50 years until 1995 when they finally brought out a paperback edition and they now sell a thousand copies a year. I don't do anything like that. But uh, I'm just happy to have it last for that long. And then I have a second book that also dealt with this called Women, Family, and Utopia, which is written more for a general audience and isn't, hasn't got all the 
uh, detailed uh, stuffs in it, and and that's still in print after uh, 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 28 years. So I'm I'm still still happy for well, that. And Mary Ann told me that they used this as a textbook at BYU, and I was shocked to hear that. Well, <laughs> did I, you know that? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I've, I did after they, after she told me. Uh, uh, but um, that was another interesting thing. Uh, my my editor wanted me to call it sexuality and religion, and I absolutely balked on that. You know. I said, no, it's about religion first, and then it's the sexuality comes in second. Their, their religious goals were primary, and the sexual in, 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 in bits of it came in after that. And, um, and so I, I really feel that, uh, you know, and he uh, jokingly suggests I should call it sex and sects. <laughs> but I, I you know. I said, absolutely not. I'm, I'm trying to reach a, a broad range of people, including Mormons, and I don't want to uh, just, uh, offend people. But after it was published, just for fun, I went into the Deseret bookstore in um, Salt Lake and, uh, and asked if, I, I didn't identify myself, I just asked if they had this book by um, Lawrence Foster uh, called Religion and Sexuality. And uh, there was a young lady at the counter who sort of blanched at the title, and then an older one came up and said, uh, yes, we keep it here um, behind the counter. <laughs> and now, now, now Brigham Young, and now at BYU bookstores have asked me to you know, autograph copies for oh, them wow. and, and all this other stuff. So, so it's, it's gotten a little bit more, uh, more play over time. But, it wasn't uh, in a brown paper wrap or anything. No, no. <laughs> But, but Fawn Brody had that. That was the same thing with Fawn Brody. They used to have her book, but it, in the Deseret bookstore. But they, oh, really? but they, but they, but you had to ask for it behind the counter. Oh, I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was, I was pleased that I was in the same, uh, sort of some of the same uh, sort of uh, company as as that. Well, that's interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Larry Foster. In our next conversation, we'll go into more detail into some of these other groups that Dr. Foster compares with Mormons, the Shakers and the Oneida community. I think all of these groups promised, they were all perfectionists. They all believed in continuing revelation. They all believed in, they were all out of New York State. They were all Protestant, believed in the imminent millennium in some way, shape, or form. And they even used the same identical biblical passage to support celibacy, group marriage, and polygamy. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.